This is Jesse. This is Sean. And welcome to GenderCast, our trans masculine gender query. Join us as we discuss our journey through gender expression, trans masculine culture, identity, and navigating the binary in our communities. Welcome to GenderCast episode 24. I have been left to my, completely left to my own devices for this interview. And I am, this is Jesse down in Portland actually with Lucian Justice, who is someone that Sean and I actually saw on one of the Seattle based allyship organizations, queerly classed panels. And this panel was specific to economic justice. And we were really taken with Lucian and his story. Immediately beeline for him after. After the panel was over and wanted to do an interview and so now it's got six months later I think I think we're so. able to sit down and do an interview and so you've since moved to Portland and I happen to be down here this weekend so we're super excited to be on and Sean is not here but we all got to Skype together and talk about what we would talk about today so Sean you're here in spirit so I think we're just gonna jump into some of the questions that we had for you so first of all we ask everybody to kind of self-identify and just kind of talk to us a little bit about your gender identity and why you might be on a podcast around gender and a little bit about your gender journey and sort of any sort of history or anything you want to talk about around that. Thanks, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. I didn't realize it's a compliment here that you were taken with what I had to say. That's, that's really sweet. And I'm very, very happy to be, be here with you. I've seen you around Seattle a bit and always wondered who you were. <laughs> so it's nice to finally know what you do a little bit. So yeah, my name is Lucian. Like Jesse said, I'm a transgender male or man. He, him, his, my gender journey. It feels uh, somewhat complex, but I'll, I'll try to keep it, uh, you know, as clear as possible. <laughs> I'm sure the listeners, listeners will be familiar with the journey of sorts and the path. It has been kind of long and arduous at times and then also incredibly fulfilling and, and, and easy and just what it was supposed to be and, and what it is supposed to be. But it all feels pretty complex compared to, I guess, what's considered normal out there in the world and a lot of the, the people that who I interact with. I do feel very different from a lot of people and that's something that I still struggle with feeling different. Like for example, I just came from a kickball practice. <laughs> uh, you know, to some extent, I wonder why I surround myself with cisgender and mostly straight identified folks, but I think I do that for a reason, which we'll get into later. But in any case, I was heard a lot and I was like, her, who, who is, who is her? Who is she? Who, who is that? <laughs> I've been on T for almost a year. I'm actually coming up on my one year anniversary in April. And thanks a lot. It's, it's been great. So let's see, six years old, my father dies and got to take care of mom because mom's very depressed. And so just kind of really switched into this very, uh, you know, like holding space. It felt very, I don't know, this feels contentious to say this in a way, but very much like a holding space kind of, kind of place for her. And I think that was natural to me, but I also do think that that really did shape my gender identity. I felt in a way like I was her husband all of a sudden. And, you know, later on I realized that that was very difficult and I kind of came to terms with how that affected me. I've worked through a lot of that, which is, which is fantastic, but to suddenly be someone's husband at six years old, it was intense and it definitely boxed me in to a certain extent. So skip forward eight years, my mom marries this guy. I think all I'll say about him is that I recall really admiring his stature, his physical body, his prowess, his vitality as a man and as a person was something I admired very deeply. And I recall wanting to be a lot like him, wishing my body was like his. I mean, he was six, he is six two. Wow. I mean, just the envy was like, I didn't realize how much I was uh, swimming in it, you know, and, and have been since a very young age, swimming in envy around maleness and men's bodies. I even used to stare at his Levi's, his like crotch area. And I would think, I want my jeans to look like that. No joke. It really did happen. It really did. And I think that's all very interesting in terms of just, you know, watching my gender evolution over time. I was also very happy in my, in my body and, and watching it grow and watching it mature and, and enjoying how my 
my gender was developing, I felt like a very sexy woman. Like I was a good looking girl. I did it well. I have to say I did it well. I was, I felt attractive. You know, I was a tomboy and very athletic, but I was like kick ass. I enjoyed wearing tight Levi's and like I liked how my ass felt in the Levi's and I liked like the curvature of my hips. And I remember having long hair and like feeling free as I would ride my bike down the street with my long hair and just so beautiful. I felt beautiful. And so I can say I, I really enjoyed that. And then all of a sudden, I was 26 years old. I was at Cafe Vivace on, uh, back when it like existed and it's, I don't even go into the new one. I'm so uh, like uptight <laughs> about that and just like, I won't even go into the new Vivace. It's not the old one. But um, anyway, I went into the bathroom. I looked in the mirror and the fury, like the fire, I was livid with my hair. And it was so sudden, it was like, ah! I was like, I literally wanted to punch the mirror, you know? And I was just like, <laughs> simultaneously witnessing this fury and fire in my chest and seeing my face get red. And I was also very conscious of, of it and was like, what is going on there? Like, what is that? What is happening? So, I mean, Saturn return? I don't know. <laughs> Very yeah. intense beginning of a Saturn return, I think. And having gone through such an incredible journey in the last few years prior to turning 30, I do believe in Saturn returns. <laughs> it's so nice to hear someone else bring it up because mine was definitely rough. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd love to hear about that sometime. We'll post a link to what a Saturn return is. <laughs> Please do. Please do. So two days later, I was in a chair getting my hair completely cut off. And it was down to my, you know, my, my hips. It was long and thick and beautiful. And like, everybody loved it, including me, until I hated it. I didn't know why. I just knew I needed it to get off of me right now. Um, and so I went through this really intense experience of like, oh my God, my mom, what is she gonna think? She's been so proud of my hair my whole life. And I just knew it was gonna be this really intense, contentious topic with her. And my mom has been a very significant person in my life, like my best friend when my father died. So wow, to like piss her off in any way or like upset her or, it was very, very, very challenging. But I did it anyway, because I needed to. <laughs> Two weeks later, I meet this woman. Um, and after I met this woman, I, I'm having a hard time not saying her name. I went into my car and cried and called my mom and was like, Oh my god, I met this woman and I think my whole life is going to change. And it did. I married her. Um, <laughs> I asked her to marry me three, three months later, actually, which felt like you know, I was sort of embarrassed to admit that to everyone at the time, because who does that, you know? I didn't even believe in marriage until I met her, but I just knew, I just knew it was right, and so I did it, I acted on it, and I have never regretted that. It's, it was a very good decision. So how does that relate to my gender identity? Well, I really, when I met her, I realized I, I really wanted to be called he, all of a sudden. Very, all, very sudden. I was just like, okay, going with you heart, going with you spirit, hearing what you want, and I'm, it's confusing. Where did this come from? I, I, I'd never felt that way before. Seriously, I was 26 when this happened, so it was just like, what is going on here? So, but please call me he. That's best. And if anybody didn't, I was really fucking pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> the only way that I can really describe that is that it was just this, like, very present feeling in my chest and in my gut, and I knew what I needed to do. And I just, that's what I needed to do, period. Even if I couldn't explain it intellectually. So she just happened to be a sex worker. And I was like, wow, hi, I, I'm really falling in love with you. And now I need to go to Costa Rica, bye. <laughs> this is really intense. Uh, I just became a man, um, but now I have tits. So I've always had them, but um, now they're confusing me. So I have to integrate. Bye, see you later. <laughs> Went to Costa Rica for three months and did, and, in, and integrated. Learned how to stand up for myself because uh, the University of Washington teacher that I was a teaching assistant for, <laughs> I had a meeting with her before we went to Costa Rica. She hired me as a teaching assistant. So she called me into her office and she said, hey you, my name actually, <laughs> you know, I really respect that you want to be called he, but I don't think we should have the students call you he. Because I was a teaching assistant for a 
an undergraduate program that was going to Costa Rica. I don't want them to call you he. It's too confusing. It's too much. They're going to be traveling abroad and that's just too much to ask. Seriously, she said this to me. And, you know, just out of respect for her ignorance and process, I won't say her name, but I want to. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't. I won't. And anyway, I was like, you know, I respect that that's how you feel, but no. They're going to call me he. I need to be called he. Like, my, my soul is crying out. It has to happen. So, just deal. <laughs> and so it was a miserable three months, but it was a good integration, and I learned how to stick up for myself. And so, came back to the States. I went to California with my wife because she was on a work trip. And I thought, oh, this will be a good time to integrate the sex work part of our relationship, which until then we hadn't really worked on or, or th I, I, I really I knew that that was what she was doing and it didn't bother me and I was like very clear on uh, I felt as though I was clear on her boundaries and what she was doing and how that was influencing her and how that would relate to me turns out I was completely ignorant had no idea what I was getting into and thus the story ensues so I've realized I've take up, taken up like 15 minutes on this one question um, so I'll end there I think that's actually a good segue because the next question is actually for you before we start asking you some of the other questions for you to actually just to define for the audience what sex work means and so doing that in context with your with your partner and then also or your you refer to her as your wife mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then also within your own context and then that'll kind of set the stage as we ask some of the other questions sure i think in a way all of these questions around sex work are very complex so it's hard to be succinct about these things and i'll just try to allow myself to ramble a bit realizing that these things these questions are so complex jesse um <laughs> and so i i know how i'd like to start this i'm one person i'm i'm one voice i'm one transgender dude who does sex work so i will only speak from my own experience right but every single sex worker i meet has a different story, seriously. And they will define sex work in a different way. So it's really important to get a lot of different perspectives on this. Kind of like trans people. Yes. Defining their gender. <laughs> yes, exactly <laughs> like that, exactly like that. And as it should be, as it should be. Sex work, there are a lot of people in the sex industry and sex trade, and there are a lot of different terms that people use. I like the terms sex trade. I'm really enjoying that. But I've also you know, identified, and still do, identify as a sex worker and I think what that means for me is that I work in a very specific way with clients who are either interested in an entertainment aspect of their sexuality or and they really go into two different categories sometimes they also cross categories I'll say that as well but or they want to work on a specific healing with their body their sexuality their gender sometimes they're both and oftentimes with the people I see they're they're not necessarily aware of what their soul is seeking it's just seeking depth it's seeking newness diversity it's seeking new expression and they see me where I advertise and they are somehow drawn to something different and so they come to see me sometimes it is very specific they do come to me for specific reasons but in any case I work with these clients on their sexuality so I am sexual with these with these people. There's excitement, there's pleasure, there's breath work, there's talking. There's a, really a variety of different things that I do with these clients that I have. In terms of other people on the sex trade, I'll say that, gosh, I mean, there are so many different ways to express and to be a sex worker. Dancers are sex workers. I really feel, you know, like I shouldn't say who are sex workers. You should say who if you're a sex worker mm -hmm. and that's really how I feel about it I mean I know some people who sell pornography like rent porn videos and they consider themselves sex workers and it just really depends so it's all about self-identifying okay so you started to talk a little bit about your clients and so the next question that we had for you was for you to talk a little bit about your clients and kind of a general sense of course not identifying any of them yeah. and what they might be looking for when it comes to gender and sex and yeah, I'll just leave it at that right right okay. there and then I'll ask a little bit more. Okay, yeah, and I've, I've answered a, a teeny bit 
of that already, which is great. So like I said, some people come to me for entertainment. They want to have a sensual experience and they want to have it with someone new where there are no strings attached. Someone whose integrity they trust, they know I will keep our interaction a secret. It's in my interest to do so and it's in their interest to do so. By and large, I feel as though people I see are very much middle class, upper middle class, pretty, I would say, <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel a little like worried about saying this, but I want to say pretty average American men. Now, within that, I'll, I'll also add that there are so many different types of people who come to see me. I have the utmost respect for them. However they are and whoever they are when they come to see me, I have a lot of respect for where they are because I know that life has brought them to me and this is who they are and life has shaped them as they are where they are. And I think that's really important to be a sex worker and kind of to be non-judgmental, even adoring of your clients is really good. I also often get mad and dis and, and have disrespect for them. It, it's like any relationship. There's love and hate. But I think that there are a lot of myths out there about clients. I think that there are a lot of myths out there about sex workers. It's just unreal. Like today before this podcast, I went ahead and Googled sex worker and transgender and all of these things came up about like sex worker is associated with addiction like if you're a sex worker according to like about.com you might have sex addictions and or drug addictions just so you know <laughs> which i thought was fascinating because i don't consider myself to have either and i thought that that was completely inaccurate and i mean it's just such a diverse community to pigeonhole it in certain ways i think is is doing a disservice to all of humanity. I work in the sex trade. I work with sexuality. That's so complex and so deep. I googled it too and maybe put it in a little bit different but I feel like this and it's a total myth and it's a stereotype of like a trans woman and you and you see like the specific categories. It's totally fetishized, sensational, like the she-male. It's just like gross, 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 like what like the mainstream porn industry does with trans people, which is one of the reasons that I'm really glad that you're here to like tell us your story and talk about what you do and give people access to something different because, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Trans people, it's like we're already freaks, but then I just feel like that takes it to a whole nother realm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the next question that we had for you was, and I guess this would be in your opinion, and maybe this has come out in conversations with some of your clients, but do your clients come to you to explore aspects of their own gender or gender identity? Really, really glad you brought that up. And not only their gender identity, but their, their sexual identity. I had this one client who in the last three years has called me once a month because after his session with me, he realized that he wanted to try having sex with men. And... He'd fantasized about it, but he'd never done it. And I feel like I was very much a gateway drug for him. <laughs> God, and what a great feeling it was in that session when, can I be explicit? I was literally, you know, pegging him or fucking him up the ass or I had a strap on on and I was um, penetrating his, his um, anal area. And I say, I say all those things because there's so many different ways to express it. And so I'm just, you know, throwing out a few. Yeah, being clear. And he was looking at me and he was saying, oh my God, you could be a man. You could be a man doing this to me right now. And he was so in his head, even though he was having this very physical experience for the first time. And in the moment, I, you know, I tried to get him to take a deep breath, to breathe into what he was feeling in his body, to, you know, <laughs> be a healer or whatever. Whatever. That, you know, it was ridiculous. Obviously, I realized that even in the moment and was like, look, if you need to be in your head, go ahead. What do you need to say about this? This is like blowing your mind right now. Whoa, I get it. Like, okay, whatever you need to say. And so he just went off on this stream of consciousness about how crazy it was that I could be a guy fucking him. Little did he know <laughs> that I do consider myself to be a guy, but I am a different kind of guy for sure. And absolutely happy with being a different kind of man that's you know one end of the spectrum in terms of how my clients explore their gender identity and, and sexual identity for him he was exploring his sexual identity now other clients come to me and they'll want to experience the same thing but they don't consider the, themselves gay and what they'll say to me is i want to be a girl i want to be your girl 
and but they're very attracted to female bodies and female form in that aspect i would say it's different than exploring their sexual orientation or sexual identity they're more exploring their gender identity and wanting to like literally shift it up and switch it around a bit and like try something on and in this way i feel so privileged because so many men come to me and say i can't explore this with my wife i can't explore this with my girlfriend in fact, many of them have tried and tell me that they do try, but that to say that they want to be a girl or to say that they want to be penetrated anally is like so stigmatized and the women in their lives label them with criticism in, in critical ways, in ways that, are, that make it difficult to safely explore these things. And they're completely legitimate things to explore. So in a way, that's kind of where I come in. That's part of what I... That is what I provide. That's kind of like my niche in a way. And also these, these men get to explore being with a man if they want to, because I am very much able to step into manhood and to be a man with them. At the same time, I can also be a female with them. I'm definitely both. Like I was saying to you earlier before this podcast, and I think this is a great way to say this. I feel like I have two people in me, probably a hundred more, but for the, for the sake of this conversation, <laughs> There's a female in me and there's a man in me. And the female has breasts and has, you know, vagina and has a female form. And the, the male in me is like, what are these tits doing here? And at least now you have a little cock. But before you did tea, you didn't have, a, you know, your cock was so small. But I worked with it and it was good. And now it's even better. And so I'm really like, have been working on integrating the two and being cool with the two. But while out in the real world, it's difficult to have those two very distinct personalities in me, it is my purpose, it, it gives me this job that I literally feel like is a path that I was completely meant to do and I'm happy doing and don't even see an end in sight. So I think you kind of answered the next question, which was talking about, and, and you might want to elaborate a little bit more, talking about how sex work and being trans and how they interact. But I really like the way that you talk about your gender queerness because I usually tend to talk about my feminine side as faggy and put it more through like a male lens and don't necessarily take the ownership. And I really admire that you do it, that you talk about it that way. That's awesome. And I really like what you said about how it's an opportunity for people to try something on because I feel like all of this is so stigmatized. And then even with like queer identity, it's you know the first thing people think about is like sexuality and then you know even with trans identity people think about sexuality so i feel like it's both challenging the stigma but it's also super important to be talking about sexuality because queer people have sexuality just like everyone else and trans people have sexuality just like everyone else so i mean we touched on it a little bit in our episode on bisexuality but not to this extent so I definitely appreciate you being here and being vulnerable to talk about it. Anyway, I'm kind of rambling, but anything else on how, and you started to talk about it, but how doing sex work and being trans and how those things interact for you? Oh, right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think this is a good opportunity to share that. Wow. I live in this world as it is right now. It exists. It's 2012. And I am not out to all of my clients about being transgender. To be honest and to be very frank, I'm, I'm afraid to do that. Would they go away? Would they not like me anymore? Would they not want to see me anymore? I mean, I have all these very real questions and and then I have also several clients who know that I'm taking tea and appreciate it and like it and I wrestle those clients. The reason I say that is because like they appreciate masculine strength and this the whiskers on my face that are coming in and the kind of testosterone smell that I have under my arms, like they really dig that and they get into that and they enjoy that. So it's interesting because there are clients that I've had for years who all of a sudden are talking about other trans people who they know. And so obviously that's a, that's a door and they can either walk through it or not. And with some clients I've walked through it and say, and have said, Hey, I'm trans, <laughs> you know, I mean, clearly you have trans people, so you get something about it. And you know, I thought you should know. And they come back to me and they enjoy that and, and that aspect of my identity and and they are cool with it. Funny though, the, the client that I just talked to you about a moment ago, he was all in his head about, you know, wanting to experience sex with men. So I saw him in New York recently and I told him that I was trans at the end of the session. He was like, I think I knew that because I felt whiskers on your face. And I had actually told him that I, there was something that I really wanted to tell him. And he's still, still dealing so much with internalized homophobia and, 
you know, internalized whatever, all the all the internalizations <laughs> that he was like, oh, he didn't even realize what he was saying to me in the moment when he said, oh, I can't, you know, I can't do that, you know, like, this trans, you know, can't do the trans thing. And I was like, dude, you just, you just did the trans <laughs> thing. You really liked the trans thing. So what I was trying to share with him is that he's having a hard time dating men and a hard time dating women. And I was like, well, just date a trans person. I mean gosh, that might be a fun experience for you because you seem to have fun with trans people. Hello, I just had a session with you. <laughs> but it was it was very clear that he was projecting his, his hate, his internalized stuff, his fear and all of that. And so sadly, I'm not sure if I'll see him again. And that's a reality of being trans and kind of being in this really in-between state in so many ways, just physically and spiritually. It's a place I occupy very comfortably, but it's not so comfortable for a lot of the world. And so, you know, it's an opportunity for growth for all of us. It's so interesting because while you were talking, I was like, that's really not much different than how it is for me in the workplace. Like that whole thing of coming out and like, and it, but for you, you're talking about it on multiple levels, like coming out as a sex worker or coming out as a trans person. And it's just like, constantly and we, we were just talking about this on another episode about masculinity almost wanting to come out to show transness but then trying to navigate that but when you were talking i was i could almost transpose with you and lee and i were for like an office atmosphere so it's very different but there's so many similarities and then i had another thought when you were your client not being able to do the trans thing and you saying that you just that you, you yeah that you had just done that and which circles back to coming out because I think I think it's important to come out of course with safety and all those things in mind because a lot of times people that person that client is obviously drawn to you and is attracted to you and likes you likes the person that you are and like that's I think that should come first and oh you happen to be trans you happen to be all these like list of things that you are and I feel like that's that othering that happens I mean it happens to everybody but that's yeah. the othering that happens that it's so important which is why of course acknowledging like if people have concerns for their safety why it is so important to come out so I definitely think it's amazing that you came out to him and think that that's really mm -hmm. awesome and sure. you might lose a client for it but you honored yourself so can I speak to that for yeah a minute? I really think that the othering thing that you just mentioned a second ago was really significant and I think that it from a spiritual perspective on all of these different identities I feel like being transgender and also being married to another sex worker and being a sex worker has been this like ego dissolution dissolutionment I should say and a dissolution <laughs> both <laughs> Freudian slip yeah so it's been a you know just first I was gay well, I thought I was straight. Actually, I think I'm turning straight again, which is interesting. Anyway, uh, so straight, and then I was gay. I had to come out as gay. Oh, yay. And then I was transgender. I had to come out as trans. Oh, yay. And then I was sex... Well, before that, I was a sex worker. So, like, all of these constant coming outs has completely been this education in othering and, and education in how I'm not other. None of us are other. It's an illusion, it really is. But I think the gift of being trans, while it has been so fiery and so intense, and at times I've really felt like, I don't think I'm gonna make it. I really don't think I can do this, this is really way too hard. I'm finally at a point where I feel like, yay, the fruits of my labor are coming and I'm actually pretty darn cool with myself and I'm realizing that more and more, all of these labels are, are really just things to be shed. And while they're good and they're identity markers and identities are really important, there's this other realm, there are these other dimensions of just, you know, what we are at our core and who knows what the hell that is, right? But I just think it's interesting that walking this very fiery path, and there are so many fiery paths, so many really intense paths, that's what I mean by fiery, it's just an opportunity to shed what's inaccurate or what's not truth. It's, just ego, really, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, well stated. So getting back to the questions. So the next one I have is, does the gender of your clients affect access to sex? I think maybe more than gender, I think their, their anatomy definitely affects their access to sex through sex work, I suppose. I don't know where they're getting sex elsewhere. 
And I don't know about that. I can't really speak to that. There are, you know, disparities everywhere. And I was going to say, well, I think the world is becoming a better place in terms of fairness and equality, in terms of, like, how much people get paid or what they have access to, but it's still really messed up in a lot of ways, obviously. Seems to be becoming more messed up in some ways. Mm -hmm. What is it with this recent controversy uh, around the pill? Um, <laughs> but anyway, let's not get into that, right? But yes, I mean, my perception... And I'm, again, I'm like only one person is that, and I could be wrong. I'm totally going to say that I could totally be wrong. All you academics out there, I have no idea if this is actually accurate, but my perception is that in general, men have more money to, to play with, I guess. Being said that all of my clients are exclusively men. In the four years I've been doing this, I've had like maybe three women want to see me. And I'm like, what, where are all the women? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's, in, that's interesting. And so I think that speaks to how much money people have, certain people with, you know, privileges. certain geni genitalia, and that does mean certain privileges, yeah. You know, it also asks a, a more broader question of, like, what about how different anatomy and, and hormonal structures affect sexuality and sex drives and things like that? And, and gosh, I don't, I don't know about everyone else. I think that there are a lot of women who have really intense sex drives out there, like, seen it but i know for me when i started taking testosterone my sex drive did raise it did increase that's just really fascinating to me and also the way that i relate to sex feels different now that i have more testosterone running through my system and trust me I, i've considered like is this socialization am i becoming a man and i'm like so thinking and feeling it's okay to interact with my sexuality and in these different ways that are tip more typically male like thought about all of this and there's really just difference in desire and difference in the way that I desire and difference in the way that I interact with my sexuality. And so that's just very real for me. I can't, I don't exist in a vacuum. I don't exist separate from this society. So it's really hard for me to tease out, what is society? What is the thoughts wrong? What is that? <laughs> like, Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's funny. I was just at the doctor getting my levels checked and just sort of getting my initial check in and... My doctor reminded me, well, you know, when you start taking testosterone, it can also make your estrogen levels increase. And I was like, oh, yeah, I kind of forgot about that. Like, I know we had talked about it at some point, and Sean's like a walking encyclopedia when it comes to, like, more on the, like, he like the health side, like, the medical side of stuff. But I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I don't want any more of that. But, yeah, I mean, it all is interacting. So I feel like that is a really good precursor to the next question. So you had already kind of talked about how starting to medically transition has affected your own stuff. So the follow-up we had to that was, has anything changed about your participation with clients since you came out as trans and or started to medically transition? So I think we were kind of speaking to more like be came out behaviorally, but any just in sort of how you're experiencing how you're interacting with clients too. My answer to that is no. And the reason for that is really just that I have very specific boundaries about what I will and won't do. And part of that is just for my own personal health and safety. And part of that is because I'm married and I'm in a monogamous relationship that is, you know, we'll get into another question around why my relationship I consider to be like a monogamous polyamorous relationship. <laughs> but in terms of my practice, I've really kept it into a very specific category of things I will and won't do with them. Now, I will say that I definitely have desire, which is new for me, to, you know, to open up my interactions with my clients. And that's fascinating. <laughs> and gosh, I, maybe it's the estrogen. Maybe I'm taking more testosterone and now I have more estrogen. <laughs> I don't know. What do you mean by open up? Um, oh, what do I mean by opening up? Like the last time that I was attracted to and fantasize, actively fantasizing about men, I was 16. And right. I do mean cisgendered okay. men. My boyfriend cheated on me when I was 16 and I was like, oh, that sucks. He sucks. This sucks. And then I met a woman and I immediately fell in love. So I think from that point on, it was easy for me to be attracted to and to enter into relationships with women. So I, I think what I did was I kind of like put this attraction to men in a little sweet, well-packaged box and put it under my bed and was like, when this is ready, you can unwrap it. But it wasn't going to be ready for like a decade, <laughs> more than that. <laughs> so I've been really thankful to my wife who at one point was cool with me opening up my, my practice and opening up my participation level with my clients. And so I did, and I allowed myself to have intercourse where I was penetrated 
for a period of time. And that was also incredibly fascinating. I mean, really, like, this job is such an observational study. It really, really is on so many to- <laughs> so many levels and so many different ways and topics. And so it's my own observational study on who I am and what I am and where I am and how I am and who I am. But it's also that for the people I'm seeing. So simultaneously. That's not a current practice. I- I'm not having intercourse with my clients now. And part of that is to just kind of keep keep things pretty clean and clear for me and my practice and also with my wife and I have no trouble you know adhering to those boundaries I will say that the desire is there to really to have intercourse with my clients to experience more depth with them sexually or I should say not my clients but I mean just men in general right (laughs) but it's just that I'm interacting sexually with men so that is where I'm noticing my desire Mm -hmm. like when I'm walking down the street and I see a guy I don't really feel attraction it doesn't really happen for me. But if I'm in a room and I'm naked with a male-bodied person, then I can feel attraction there. Does, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Whereas, like, if I see a, a really beautiful woman walking down the street with a really, you know, voluptuous physical body type, I'm like, whoa, like, totally attracted to that, like, immediately. But it's very different for me when it comes to men. feels like could be trust. Part of that is like, well, who what the hell are you? Perhaps I should feel that way about women, too, you know? I don't know. I guess I just, I do, I do, though. I do and I don't. That's another, you know, hour-long conversation. So the next sort of realm we're going to delve into is relationships. And I know we've touched on this already. We thought it'd be interesting to have you talk a little bit more about how being trans, doing sex work, and being in what you called a monogamous polyamorous relationship all interact and how this plays out. And you spoke to this a little bit, so maybe a little bit more in depth. And then I definitely think talking about what polyamory means to you and probably also what monogamous polyamory means to you <laughs> that's a lot of questions well <laughs> start anywhere <laughs> yeah and i mean just to be clear i think that's the first time i've coined the term monogamous polyamorous relationship for myself so but i think it should be fairly clear <laughs> i mean it feels clear to me <laughs> indeed you know it actually feels really really pretty clear because i'm polyamorous in that I have sexual experiences with people outside of my marriage. So that feels poly to me. I experience physical, sensual interactions as being this this thing that most monogamous relationships would not include in their agreements. And so I think that's what makes it poly for me. Having said that, I don't go into my sessions thinking and feeling, wow, I'm going to get a lot out of this like my body is going to get a lot out of this I'm going to get my needs met like I do get a lot out of it I do feel satiated I do feel uplifted I feel fulfillment I feel purpose in my sessions I, I enjoy them very very much but they're not really meeting my needs except for financially I mean I'm really there to hold space for them to help them meet their needs so in that way just as additional clarification there and I'm monogamous in that I'm married to one person and she's my lover. I don't have other lovers. I have very, very, very close friendships. Very, very close friendships, but but not, you know, sexual friendships. If I had sexual friendships, I think I would say, yeah, now I'm in a polyamorous relationship. So I don't know if that makes sense, but that's pretty much essentially why I say a monogamous polyamorous relationship. Do you want to speak any more to how how that plays out and maybe talk a little bit about your partner also being a sex worker (laughs) i do i do because she deserves some mention my wife is also a sex worker and it has been very very hard for me that she does sex work very hard which is so hypocritical (laughs) god (laughs) i've hated myself over my feelings about it but really it's not that you know it's not that she's getting paid the work aspect of it hasn't been what's challenging for me although sexism has come up for me around the fact that she gets paid for it and that was intense initially in our relationship i was like wow there's so much like rampant sexism happening here like all of these men can afford to see you and like that's really fucked up and you know i went through i've gone through so many layers of shit around having a wife who does sex work because it's really brought to the forefront what is very real in society and i'm an observer i'm a seer and so i've seen a lot of messed up things that are current dynamics in society that obviously are going to play out if you have sex work involved because sex work is an intersection for everything it's gender it's sexuality 
it's money, it's race, it's class, it's uptown, downtown, it's everything from here to there. And so it all, you know, when I initially started this work, was right in my face. It was right in my face. And I just was so overwhelmed. It was such an initiation. Wow. So what was the question again? (laughs) Oh, right. How does that, you know, and so my, my lovely, lovely wife has been so great to me in terms of saying to me, go explore this new industry that I've essentially introduced you to and I'll mentor you. And whenever you want to have a session, have a session and thank you for working. And I'm glad you're exploring your identity and here, here's a lot of freedom. Here's 10 keys to 10 different doors. Here's a hundred keys to a hundred different doors. I'm cool with it. And I said, no, no, you shouldn't have any keys. You shouldn't have any doors. You shouldn't have any access. You should have no freedom. No, it's too much. I can't do it. Oh my gosh, I can't do it. And so in that way, it was really unfair. And I just want to be really like frank and upfront about that because jealousy and envy are so stigmatized. And that is pay dirt, man. Like that is pay dirt. If you feel jealous or envious or fear or rage, fury, God, I've felt all of it. And and jealousy is so incredibly complex in that way because it encompasses so many different feelings. And yet it has this label of jealousy. And that's so awful if you're jealous. You're such a fucked up person and you're so insecure and you're so messed up. And like, why don't you just get a life? And all of these various things that I've heard in society, I've been through it all. I've been through a lot of it in terms of how I relate to my own jealousy. She has really taken some time off. She's taken some time off from work to let me chill out, to let me integrate, to let me come to terms with the complexity of my identity and how that interacts with her sex work and society. And I think that was incredibly generous of her. And I also think that the path of being a trans male sex worker is not an easy one. And so I'm completely incredibly grateful to her for that. I think she saw that how vulnerable I was and am. And I think she was like, look, I can see this is almost impossible. And so I'm going to just, I'm going to take a back seat. And that was wonderful in a way. And it was also sexism playing out in our relationship in a way, right? Since I identify as a, a guy and she identifies as a girl. So, and obviously we're very conscious of that. But it didn't make it any easier being conscious of it in a way it made it worse because we were just like, wow, this is really fucked up, but this is what we have to move through. And God, it was such an exercise in self-acceptance and humility and again, like ego washing away, ego burning, ego dying, ego death. (laughs) (laughs) And just to really quickly kind of go into where the jealousy and envy was coming from, I wanted to be a man. I wanted to be her clients. I wanted to have a penis and have her interact with my penis like I'm a man. And so that is so intense because I'll never have that. I'll never have like... I'll never choose to have surgery and to have a penis. I'll I'll never be born male. And while I've really come to terms with that, it was really saying to me, you need to take tea. You need to at least move along this path of being more masculine in your gender identity. You want a lower voice. You want whiskers. You want to have identifiers that people will recognize and will allow them to see you as a man out in the world. And it wasn't until it was in my face through my wife and through the work she was doing that I knew that it you know it was so buried it was so pushed aside it was so shoved away because it's so bad to want those things to want to transition is seen as so awful trans people are so thrown to the curb and so it made sense that I really like buried all of those desires I buried all of those desires so the last four years prior to taking tea have been about uncovering those desires, taking back the, the covers and saying, oh, there, see, there's a desire there. And it turns out desire is really important. Mm-hmm. It turns out that these, like, it's the way our soul speaks to us. Thank you, love. <laughs> I love you. That just blows my mind because I can't even think about having all of the gender stuff at play with that fundamental, like, jealousy thing of what someone else can give the person that you are with that you can't give them. Like, that, that, that thing, like that absolute black and white thing, like that they, someone else has something that you don't have layered with all the other stuff. And you said it much more eloquently than I can, but wow. Yeah. 
That's that's pretty intense. Thank you for sharing that. Can I speak yeah. really quick again? Um, I also just want to clarify one thing: <laughs> is that like my wife very much likes female genitalia. It was literally all my fucked upness, which I say lovingly. I really do, because it's all cool. I'm all fine with that. That fucked upness, I am. I love it. In fact, you have to love it a little bit, don't you? I mean, it's there for a reason points us in a direction it provides contrast because she's so into the female genitalia she's into like masculine oriented female bodied people they can be lesbians they can be butch dykes they can be trans people it doesn't fucking matter to her she just wants this masculine female bodied person well i am that so theoretically i should have no problem mm-hmm. with who she's interacting theoretically with. <laughs> <laughs> but that the- theoretically doesn't always cover the mind fuck that we get ourselves into (laughs) so in terms of jealousy how do you get through that how does it all play out and how do you get past it that's a good question really to me it was just saying you want to be a man so much be one and so i was like for three years you know researching testosterone and like but i want to be okay with myself as i was born that's the natural thing to do Uh, you know like all these voices in my head about what i should and shouldn't do around transition and at the end of the day i just needed to you know inject myself with testosterone and like walk that path and that's like a legitimate path people (laughs) you know i had someone say to me well at least you don't have to inject yourself with hormones and i was like who the fuck do you think you're talking to and and i really admire and like this person and like i was making friends with this person and i still am and it's no big deal that they said that. It's just that the assumptions are just rampant. And why is that wrong to inject yourself with hormones? Why? Someone tell me. Mm-hmm. It's not. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so I started off with a really low dose because I wanted to see, like, how does my body like this? How does my spirit like this? Do I want to up it? Do I want to stop? Do I want to keep going with this at all? And as I've responded to those questions, I've continued. It's now been almost a year and I too walk a genderqueer line that I love. I love that. It's so special. God, so special. And who cares if other people recognize that or not? I see it. And so becoming more myself has really addressed the jealousy. Now I'm like, honey, will you please go to work? You know, we need money. <laughs> okay, you know. <laughs> and so I still have instances of, of wrenching, gut wrenching, like in my heart, or it'll come up for a second. And but what's nice about kind of being more grounded and level headed after having been on tea for a while and really like grounding into who I am, I can listen to my head and I can say, she loves you. She wants your genitals, not theirs. Just let her go do her thing so she can empower herself and she can empower you too. You know, and and I can hear my head more than I ever could before because I was just too buried. I had buried the desires, Mm -hmm. so. That's not really like how you talked about tea. Take a little bit, take a lot, take more, take less. Don't take any at all. I remember when I was talking to my doctor about it and just with friends too, like it's such a big decision that I think people are like, I'm all in, but you could be all in for a month and then not. Totally. So I, yeah. I also think that that's really important. And I don't know if listeners out there have had been in that sort of situation. And I know you have to you have to go a few months and kind of see what's going to happen. You don't have to do it. You can choose to do it or you can choose not to do it or you can choose to do it for a little while and maybe stop and then pick it back up again. So I think that that's important. Okay, so at this point, I think it'd be really good to talk about what precautions you take, you and your wife take around, what safety precautions you take around like keeping yourselves safe physically and just in a general sense so that your work isn't harmful to each other in that way. This is a really simple question. And I really do appreciate that this is one of the simplest questions that you have. I We never, ever share fluid with our clients, so we're not bo- uh, fluid bonded with them. That's that's really number one. We don't bond fluid with our, you know, fluid bond with our clients, and that keeps us really safe. As individuals and as, you know, lovers, we don't kiss our clients, for example. I don't ever give my client a blowjob unless I have a condom on, for example. If I'm using toys that I've used on other clients, I'll make sure to wash it thoroughly and I'll also put a condom on that too. Always washing my my toys and my things like my, my equipment <laughs> to making sure that it's just completely free from anyone else's bodily fluids or germs or, or anything like that. So, you know, sanitizing. Hand sanitizer is like my best friend. <laughs> I love that stuff. <laughs> and it's just like an awareness and a desire to stay safe and just making sure that, you know, we're, we're being really cautious. So you 
spoke to this a little bit, but I'm just going to ask it more explicitly just in case you left anything out that you might want to add. But how do you make your relationship work and be in sex work more from your own point of view, but also maybe speaking a little bit to the fact that you're both in sex work? How do we make it work? I, I think it's pretty constant communication. If something comes up, we talk about it. Nothing can, we can't afford to have anything put under the rug. And fortunately, you know, doing this work, we have the time to process stuff as they come up. We're in a period now where we don't have to do that as much because after so many years of having done this, you know, we kind of know the flow. We found the flow. Oh, wow, it's nice. It's really sweet. And that correlated with moving to Portland too. So it was this really nice saying goodbye to a really, really, really gray town. I love you, Seattle, but you're really gray. And, uh, not that Portland isn't, but there's a little bit more sun down here. Saying goodbye to all the patterns that we had created there and all of the conversations that we'd processed through there and coming here and, and really starting fresh, starting anew and feeling like, gosh, we're in this, I really feel like we're in this really fortunate, I'm really fortunate and grateful for this being in this place of abundance in terms of like being emotionally clearer. You know, we've worked through our shit and we're able to just kind of make it work. You know, she goes to work, I do my own work at home, my volunteer work or my activism or whatever, and then I'll go to work and she'll do her activism or, or the laundry or, you know, whatever. It's just that we have our, our own way of creating this specific give and take, you know, that I think every relationship has to mm -hmm. figure out. So basically what you're saying is it's like any relationship and you have to communicate and navigate all of the plant points. Total honesty. <laughs> So I think at this point, it'd be good to hear, you've mentioned activism a couple times, and I know that being out there and doing other things related to this and gender is important to you. And so I think it'd be really interesting to hear about maybe some of the projects that you're involved in that you want to share with us and some of the things that you have going on either here in Portland or just anything that you want to talk about. So last year was actually a really monumentous year. There was a universal periodic review that happened at the United Nations and a lot of various activists in the sex work community, both allies and sex workers, got together and, and noticed that this was a, an opportunity to kind of uh, put a spotlight on sex worker rights, United Nations. So it was historical, a historical moment in time. And so for many months, months I was working with other activists from all around the globe, actually, most of them based in the United States. And we were able to put together a report that was submitted. Essentially, what ended up happening was that a recommendation was brought forth by Aragoy, and they suggested that the United States take a very close look at the special vulnerabilities that sex workers have to human rights atrocities. And not just sex workers, but LGBTQ community as well, which is an inter interesting correlation there, just to note that, right? Like, oh, they're separate, but they're correlated and, you know, fascinating. Another topic. What they said, and I quote, is, We agree that no one should face violence or discrimination in access to public services based on sexual orientation or their status as a person in prostitution. So, wow. <laughs> that had never happened before. Not at the United Nations. So that was kind of a historical thing to, to be involved with. Do you have links that we can post with your blog post that in case listeners want to learn a little bit more about this, maybe an article that was posted about this probably? Yeah, we actually created a whole website around it, but it was taken down. So it wasn't taken down for any other reason than, you know, we just weren't able to financially sustain it and, you know, it got kind of dropped, unfortunately, but we're actually working on getting that website back up and running and it was uh, humanrightsforall.info. And so hopefully soon that will be recreated and you can go on there. But there are also sites that you can go ahead and, and look up this information on. Um, SwapUSA.org has information on this. So does the Best Practices Policy Project. They also have information on there. So yeah, I worked with so many people from so many organizations. I, I feel like I'm not going to do a great job of naming all of them right now. And so I just you know, want to say that, please do refer to that website. It will be up again and they will be named on there. So I think it's just sort of circling back to the allyship panel that Sean and I saw you on that was around economic justice. The last question that we had for you was, it's kind of a long one. Talk a little bit about your experience with the economy, finding jobs and how that relates with your transmasculine, trans male identity. Perhaps talk about differences with Seattle and Portland. So we're having a Pacific Northwest 
focus here with you talking about I mean I feel like some of this is pretty generalizable but I also think that because of the area of the country that we're in this is probably a little bit more possible than if you were like in you know the mid Mm-hmm. Middle America. And then if you want to talk a little bit about maybe other, you talked about being a TA, so it sounds like you've done a mm-hmm. lot of different stuff and so maybe yeah. other education and, and employment experiences that you've had. Maybe I'll address the education and work experience because that's the easiest part of that question. I got a bachelor's degree uh, from the University of Washington in Law, Societies, and Justice and I minored in Human Rights. And I've worked doing so many various things, everything from serving to, you know, now sex work, window washing, most recently, actually, I I was thinking I'd want to, you know, I was worried that, you know, as I transition and and begin looking more masculine, I was, I've been worried that I won't be able to get clients anymore. I don't think that that's true. In fact, I know that's, that's not true. That's not the case. I can still procure clients. It's just that I need to reach out to um, transgender sex workers and talk to them about that. And like, where do they post that's different from where I post right now? And, you know, it's a transition I'm kind of like feeling into right now. Right. So also it's difficult to come across trans male sex workers. I feel like perhaps if I were in San Francisco, it might be easier, but the Pacific Northwest has been really tough for that. Maybe I just need to look around more, but I don't I don't think that's the case. I just don't know. Right, I worked at the University of Washington for a, a while as a program coordinator there. I've been a TA for various undergraduate courses, one in London and one in Costa Rica. That was interesting and fun. Uh, I think that's, you know, pretty much about it. I'm only 30, so I don't, <laughs> you know, I've been doing sex work the last four years. It's really the first thing that I've done that I feel like is my path. It, it, it is what I'm here to do. It's really good work. It's good work. It's doing good things. A client the other day said to me, I don't know if I'll, you know, I don't know if I'll still want to come see you, you know, if you have top surgery. But he said, that would be a shame if I didn't. Like, that's ridiculous. (laughs) That's what he said. And he's also kind of shedding away these labels and thinking about his own relationship to spirit and attraction and desire and all of these things. And so great. That was awesome. And I, I, I very, you know, frankly just said to him, and you can have your preferences. So it's mm-hmm. cool, you know, yeah. and that really was, I really did feel that way and do feel that way. So to address, you know, the other part being, you know, trans masculine and the economy and jobs. Well, the economy has been not so great, <laughs> has been my perception in the last few years. And I've also, you know, had a job that I like. So I haven't looked around that much, but I will say that in general, it is been for me a really difficult experience to be in public and to be transgender to to be genderqueer mm-hmm. at all has been very difficult for me to be just in the public eye so getting a job out in the world where i'd have to interact with people and their ignorance and their questions and their projections and i swear to god some days i'm this and and other days i'm the complete opposite of that if there is such a thing it's just like all projection and so that's a lot of energy yeah, that's a lot of energy to modulate. <laughs> I think a lot of people take for granted walking through the world and just being fully accepted and having really nice interactions with everyone that they meet because they just are a part of the world and the community and they're quote unquote normal. You know, I've been passing a little bit more in the last few months and it's been just energetically a relief. I'm like, oh, I'm one of everyone. You know, it's felt safer energetically to me. Not that I need to pass, but energetically, I do appreciate that there's less, like, warfare. There's energetic warfare going on where where people are just completely and utterly confused by what I am. Mm -hmm. And they must check me out. (laughs) Stare at you. Yeah, Yeah. stares and just, like, confusion, sometimes blatant hate. My wife says to me, she's like, you know what? I think a lot of people who stare at you are probably attracted to you and that might be confusing and very threatening to them <laughs> and i was like uh, yeah i don't think that I, I whatever i don't think that that i think they're just confused <laughs> <laughs> i've had people try to tell me that one too but yeah it's like you're on the bus and you can just yeah. feel it like you can feel oh. the energy yeah. but at the same time it's like what you want to be doing you want to be challenging it but sometimes it's like can i just Can I just get through this day without people noticing? But I also want to commend you because I feel like you're also doing a fair amount of advocacy because you're, for lack of a better word, sort of bumping up aspects of the world, like cis men, probably straight identified cis men that maybe some trans people wouldn't necessarily have access to or 
cis men wouldn't have access to other trans people. And so I feel like you're also doing a lot of advocacy for us and probably challenging a lot of people's stuff that, and there's more acceptance probably around that. I don't know. That's just what I was thinking when you said that. I appreciate that. And you know, the tricky part for me when you say that is, but I'm not out to all my clients about being trans. So I'm a bad trans advocate. (laughs) I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, I got to make money and I, you know, like, I don't know if I could make as much if I cut off my tits and like grew a beard. But by God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. So I, I, I don't, you know, hopefully I'll be able to stay in the sex work industry. Hopefully there's a niche and a place for that. I, I do think that consciousness is building, things are raising, things are opening in the world in terms of the way that people interact with difference. And I have faith and hope that is what that brought up, that up for me. But thanks, you know, I do, I do try. I do have a lot of conversations with a lot of people all the time. It's like not, stop, you know this, yes. like. You can't. You can't do it all the time. <laughs> I was just thinking that'd be an interesting follow-up episode to talk to you like a year or two from now. Is there anything else just sort of as we're wrapping up here that you want to mention? Any other projects or just anything else that kind of came to you while we were talking that you want to share? Yeah, just for folks in the Northwest, there are some organizations that I'd just like to share with you some resources. There's the Sex Worker Outreach Coalition in Portland, PDX swoc.net. SWOC promotes the basic human rights and personal safety for all individuals working in the sex industry. There's also swapusa.org, which is a national organization, but there are individual chapters uh, both in Seattle and in Portland. Sex Worker Outreach Project USA is a national social justice network dedicated to the fundamental human rights of sex workers and their communities, focusing on ending violence and stigma through education and advocacy. And I just read that from their website. So we will get, make sure we have those links and we'll post them with your blog post. So if people didn't catch the verbiage when you were saying it we'll post those links with the blog post so thank you so much for coming on and having this interview with us i feel like this is one of the most intimate ones that we've done so i hope you all know how lucky you are out there to have access to this information i definitely feel honored and lucky and this is gendercast episode 24 signing off thank you so much thank you so much that was awesome (laughs) copyright 2012 gendercast our trans masculine gender query All podcasts, content, and information related to these podcasts are the property of GenderCast producers and may not be used without their written consent. Contact GenderCast at gmail.com for written permission. I am just one into this world, but what the world might see isn't always me. Cause inside is a boy trying to break free. body or my soul he just wants to share this body make me whole cause the girl this world does see is only half of me i am not the only one born under this golden sun beneath the surface you will find the million thoughts that cross my mind I am born into this world brand new Start with knowledge small, takes time to learn it all Learn to live, leave it all behind Except the different and find the peace of mind Make us who we are, what we know. Some of us are scared to let it show. Let us scream, This is me. Now it's time that the whole world see. I can